Where am I? It's time, isn't it? What do you want? Are you there? Who's talking, you or him? Who are you? Are you boys afraid of the next war, worried about it? Whose side are you on? How do you melt the multi-swag? I've got to keep in some sort of touch with all the loose ends of this dizzy affair if I'm ever going to make heads or tails of it. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power coming to you from Tbilisi, Georgia on a cool autumn day. And I'm so happy that it's cool. Um, what are we going to do today? Let's learn how to ask questions. It sounds like such a simple thing, and yet it isn't. Before we get into it, though, I would like to remind you that, hey, if you like this video, you can share it with other people. If you haven't uh, become a subscriber, you can press like. Uh, you can also uh, contribute to the channel, if you so wish, through the PayPal link below. And those who do uh, will uh, eventually get uh, ext uh, anadromist extras, sound material from the past, about 10 hours worth. Um, but, let us uh, continue thinking about questions. I, I was thinking about this, how to ask questions. This is something very important to me. I would say I base most of how I live on how I ask questions. And I don't think everybody does it the same. Not that I'm trying to say you should imitate me, but... If you're having problems getting answers, some of what I have to share might be of value to you. Asking questions isn't as easy or simple as it seems. You know, it sounds like, well, you know, hey, how come you're going down the street? It's a question, you know. Where's God? There's a question. Um, kind of an ill-formed question at that. Um but I think people expect that life will provide answers. And life doesn't. Even God doesn't work that way. Um, there, if you've read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams' uh, magnum opus, and he comes up that the, the answer to the question of life, the universe, and everything is... 42. And then the problem is, well, the problem is we don't really have a question. What is the question that leads to 42? Now, the truth is, I've heard people ever since then, uh, the 70s, uh, give like uh, 42 type answers, or even 42, just to say life is absurd. Well, life isn't absurd like that. Douglas Adams was saying that in a way to express a kind of nihilism that I don't think he quite believed. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have put it in such humorous terms. The truth is, whenever we ask questions, we start with presuppositions. We start with assumptions. We start with prejudices. We start with the propaganda that's encircling us everywhere. In other words, we never start at zero, except when we're really young, and that's the closest to zero we're going to get. But even then, you're born into a certain culture, you have a certain name, you you uh, have certain genetic features, uh, you're born into a very specific uh, land of uh, people, uh, you know, and what happens to you formulates your questions for you. Um, children's questions, I think, give us a very interesting idea about good questions, because they tend to be very simple questions, like, what is that bird? You know, what is that sound? And they also ask questions that are very simple, and yet 
end up being very profound. What is water? <laughs> you know, it's just like, well, it, it's this wet stuff, you know. No, that's not what it is. It's more complicated than that. And one thing uh, I've discovered is that people actually want to hear questions. There are people, I think a lot of people, too many people, who would like to hear questions that they already know the answers for. I've seen this particularly with bad teachers. Bad teachers would like their students to ask questions that they have the answers for. And the truth is, the students, no matter who you are, are always coming up with something you didn't expect, which is, to me, part of the enjoyment of teaching anyone, is that suddenly something will come out of left field and make me think about it when I hadn't been thinking about it prior to that. Uh, one of my favorite experiences in life uh, was going to Labrie in Switzerland. And I'm... I'm often at a loss for how to tell people what Labrie is. If I want to give some kind of shorthand, I can say it's a place that people can go where the people take their questions seriously or, you know, something like that. It's a, it's a Christian place where people take the questions of the mind, but also of the heart seriously. Um, and what you find when you go there is there are other students there and they're all, Kind of like you, they're, they've got stuff on their mind. They've been let down by other people. They're hoping to find an answer there. And, and what will happen is as you're wandering around talking to different students who could be between 18 and 80, uh, you'll find their questions prod more questions from you. And I would say, although I certainly knew how to raise a few questions when I was younger, it was going to Swiss Labrie in 1978, 79, uh, that really caused me to love questions. Um, Udo Middleman, one of uh, Francis Schaeffer's son-in-laws, once said, uh, you can ask any question, but the question, the answers aren't necessarily immediate or warm. That is to say, it's you never know where a question will lead. Questions can be dangerous. But I think questions also have to be honest. One of the problems is that there is a species of questioner today who, stout, who starts from the proposition that everything is to be doubted. And I would say the best questions don't come from that kind of existential doubt, but they come from a radical trust that what you're seeing is worth asking questions about. Um, questions should be from a quest. You see the word quest inside of question. Uh, to know why what you've seen or experienced has happened. Now, that also isn't necessarily good news. We start with the things that have happened to us. But if you, like most people, have had experiences in your life that caused you to have all sorts of, have caused you problems, damage. Your questions may actually, you may have suddenly gotten bad questions lodged in your mind. Bad questions to me would be dishonest questions or questions for which you know the answer. You know, why are things so bad? Because they always are, bad things always happens to me. So the the first question, why are things so bad, is too vague. And, and the answer is too much poor me. It doesn't actually help me to answer a question. So what is a good question? In one way, all honest questions are good questions. And so, um, you know, just any question of information, a question of... Uh, you know, you hear someone saying something, you disagree with it. And you say, now, you know, can, can you explain why you said God doesn't exist? You know, that would be an honest question. Uh, this, an honest question could be that, you know, look, I don't believe God exists. But you do. How come? I had a good atheist friend of mine ask me that. I took that as a good question. Um, a good question isn't one you necessarily like the framing of, but you can tell But the person asking it has in some way made it an honest question. This is something that genuinely puzzles them. 
But in another way, there are way too many dishonest questions. Uh, even an honest question posed at the wrong time to the wrong people can get the wrong answer. That is to say that, um, I mean, I see this on YouTube, watching someone's video. They're interviewing someone. And uh, the person they're talking to is asking questions of the person who is being interviewed. And then the interviewer will ask a question back. What am I trying to get to here? That the interviewee doesn't want to answer or is afraid the answer to this will take us totally off topic. And something dishonest happens at that moment where uh, it's, it's, see, everyone's got a vested interest in something. We've got a vested interest in how we see our lives. Those things that have happened to us in the past have led us to conclusions that now we think are right. So now if someone comes along and asks a question that th threatens that framework, then the person answering that question is going to answer with the wrong answer on purpose. Not that they're saying, I want to deceive you. They're more likely saying, I need to, you know, channel this, this question in a, in a way that fits me. Now, I know all about this because I am a, uh, an interviewer and I've been working on a documentary series about puppets. And I go in with certain questions, but sometimes the answers I get will, will lead me in a different direction. Then what do I do? Well, to be an honest interviewer, you have to follow the person, not your chain of questions. Although I've found a couple that can, I can always reliably use, but I can never assume. And I think when I was younger, I assumed more while doing that kind of questioning with people. There are different kinds of questions. Um, where does this water flow? That's a legitimate question. Uh, but it's a very different kind of a question from why does my stomach hurt? They could, they could be related. Maybe I drank this bad water and so my stomach hurts. But that also is a very different question from why won't my friend talk to me anymore? which seems to bring everything back into the realm of personal relationships. Well, maybe all these questions are also related to each other as well. Uh, my friend has developed an, an avid distaste for me, and so they've recommended I drink the bad water, and so my stomach hurts. Or a more abstract question, seemingly, and yet one very practical, what is love? And maybe that relates back to the friend, you see. Uh, all of these questions open up. What is love is a, a notoriously tricky question because on one hand, we think we know, and in a way we do. And on another hand, we're protecting something in ourself from the answer. Um, I think all questions... Assume some kind of answer. All good questions do. That is to say that um, these are questions that are not based on doubt, but based on certainty. If I ask, where does the water flow? I'm assuming that it starts somewhere. It's a good assumption because it's moving. So it's going somewhere. It started somewhere and it's going somewhere. Which is why uh, explorers in the 19th century spent an awful long time looking for the source of the Nile, which is not an easy thing to find because there are many tributaries and many river, small rivers that feed into it. And you want to know, where does this thing start? Science is based on the idea, um, and I think this is a Christian conception, that the world has meaning, the stuff in the world. It's a Jewish and then Christian uh, conception. And I think that because the stuff in the world is made by a rational God, we can expect to find some answer to our questions within it. 
which is one of the reasons why Western science got so much further than either Chinese or Islamic science. At a certain point, they stopped. And this is what Alfred North Whitehead says in his book on science. And uh, a similar thing is ma uh, argument is made in um, Tom Holland's recent book about the history of Christianity called Dominion. In a sense, and this is why my friend at Labrie said to me, all questions are permissible. You know, you can ask anything. But don't expect immediate answers. But all the questions are on the table. You know, and that gave me tremendous freedom to ask questions. You know, and I realized, oh, there isn't a question I have to be afraid of. But for many people who don't have this way of thinking, some questions will explode everything for them. And I have to be sensitive because even though I'm willing to ask all sorts of questions, if I ask the wrong person who is afraid of their questions, if I ask them a question the wrong way, that could destroy the, the uh, relationship with them. But I look at that as a problem that they never realized they had permission to ask questions. You also have the permission when someone asks you a question to say, yeah, I can't really answer that, or, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know you well enough, or, you know, there, there's no reason why we have to give answers to every question. You know, it, again, there are many, many things. But what I'm trying to get to here is what makes a good question? And for me, I mean, okay, uh, you know, I'm getting older, and I find life tremendously meaningful. Why? I spend my whole day asking questions trying to find answers, whether it's to, you know, what's going on in America right now with uh, all the political tension, or how to, you know, I've been asking questions recently about, um, I, I spent a while asking questions about oh, Halloween masks. How's that? Going back into the history of that a bit. Or uh, I've been reading about Georgian politics. There was a new book that came out about uh, whether Georgia will ever join the uh, European Union, or questions about uh, surrealism, or questions about, you know, and I'm always following these. And these aren't just abstract questions just because I think I'm somebody. They're questions because the answer to these questions will provide answers that I need to know. So, <clears throat> uh, to me, a good question, an honest question, is based on certainty. And the certainty is there is some kind of answer. Not a complete answer. There is never a complete answer to anything. That is to say, even if there is a complete answer, we, uh, we don't have access to it. And this is true in science. This is true in art. This is true in human relationships. This is even true in our relationship to God. There is no question that will provide an exhaustive answer. I can't know truth exhaustively. But I can know more than I do today. I can get closer to understanding. Hence, my questions are based on the certainty that there is more, you know, if I rummage around more in history, if I look at more art, if I read more about science or, or the economy, which is something I don't know a lot about. Uh, so it's interesting to me to read about the Georgian economy. Uh, if I, if I uh, you know, do these things, I will understand more. It will help me live. I will have something that maybe I can share with someone else. Now, what's a really bad type of question? One that not only starts with doubt, but sows doubt. Well, I think we have the, the best example of this is one of the first questions in the Bible. And the serpent says to Eve... Has God said you should not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I'm paraphrasing. And that question is interesting because he's not saying, so how come you're not supposed to eat of this tree? He's questioning the authority by which she says she's not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it undermines the reality. And what's interesting is that by following it, then you can see the consequences within the story that suddenly something is changed and the innocence is lost and suddenly 
there is darkness now. This, this question leads directly to the darkness of evil. And it's the undermining, it's the undercutting. And so I think this is a template for the kinds of questions that cause doubt, that sow dissension, that, you know, get people uh, hot and bothered, that cause people to, you know, say, well, you know, life has no meaning. Um, they start with phrases like, how do you know? How can you be sure? What makes you think, you know, um, or, or the famous uh, case of Kathy Newman talking to Jordan Peterson, and she's constantly saying, her question is phrased like this, so you're saying that, and you can tell by the way she's saying it, she's summarizing what you really mean to say. It's just like this undercutting. Um, truthfully, the world is an evil place as much it is, as it is good. You know, sometimes those questions need to be asked in order to unmask the evil. But if they eventually lead to nowhere good, but to a state of constant doubt and confusion and nihilism, something is radically wrong. When you ask questions, you have to be looking for an answer. A question is not there simply to undermine, you know, now, this is one of my problems with a lot of atheists. They seem to be, you know, kind of saying to me, and this is not every atheist, but they, but there's a certain kind of an atheist who seems to simply want to undercut everything that a person believes and provide nothing in exchange. That is to say, except to say, you've got to be honest and face that we are alone in the universe. <laughs> Great. Thanks for the help. I was doing better when I was supposedly innocent, except, you know, talking to me about that stuff is the wrong... I am the wrong person for that sort of approach. Because <laughs> I don't even get, like, that angry. I just look at it and I go, like, okay, this is kind of a childish way of dealing with this. I mean, to me, a good atheist says, you know, I don't see the presence of God. What makes you say there is one? That, to me, is a good atheist. A bad atheist just simply says, you're wrong. How do you know? What do you think? Why are you doing that? You know, they're, they're just undercutting everything. Uh, but if the situation is radically wrong, it could be radically wrong. For instance, the Holocaust is a situation that's radically wrong. And then people need to ask those kinds of questions because you, need not, you shouldn't go along with the program. You know, a lot of the Jewish people who were caught up in the Holocaust simply had no conception that such a thing was possible. They just didn't, they didn't exercise their imaginations enough. They didn't ask the right questions that such a thing was possible. And so they just, you know, they're, they're, they were marched, unfortunately, I hate to use the phrase, but like sheep, all the way to the gates of Auschwitz. They just didn't understand they just didn't know how to rebel. It would have been better for them to have fought from the beginning against it. But instead they went with it because they couldn't believe. And in that case, that kind of serious question is very appropriate. It could be the pol politics is radically wrong. And you really see this with the effect of propaganda. So the, pro uh, the person with the propagandized mind can't see outside of this narrow, like, constricted version. And you can tell because every time you, they ask a question of you, it's, it's, it could be coming out of someone else's mouth. It's never an original thought. Because the propagandized mind has to simply follow the patterns. And I see this on both the left and the right these days. There'll be people, uh, right-wing people, uh, I mean, the left is obviously all screwed up, but so is the right. The kind of people who, you know, you can see it when you don't say the right word. It's like they realize you're kind of fighting a similar thing, but then they, they will say like, yeah, but what about blank? And then they'll throw in some, one of their favorite little conspiracy nuggets in there or little, uh, you know, put downs about the world, you know. And often these people... Um, will, you know, the difference is the left-wing people these days seem to be more like 
we're trying to get to the utopia and you're in the way. Whereas the right wing, prop, the propagandized right wing people are kind of like, you don't, believe, you don't understand how bad this really is. To which I'm sitting there saying, so what you're saying is, it's so bad, I should either be up in arms and be stalking uh, weaponry, or I should just go find a noose. You know, to which I'm sitting there going like, sorry guys, I'm, I'm not on this program. I'm a human being. I do know how to think for myself. And one of the ways I learn how to think for myself is by learning to ask good questions that are not the same as asking paranoid questions. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it could be a, a, a personal relationship that's run off the rails. And, and as time goes on, you start to see that this person you're involved with has malicious intent, or they're just drawing more distant from you. There's nothing malicious going on, but there's a, there's a distance. And so it's good to ask, you know, like, well, well, why are you doing this? What is going on? And sometimes... There, are a, you know, one of the things I've realized is the more malicious a person is, the more they will deny that that anything is going on. We we now overuse the phrase gaslighting, uh, but but uh, the the people I've known in my life who were truly on the evil side were masters of this, and not just in this kind of propagandized way, but I mean of really making you think that uh, you didn't see it properly. <laughs> so, um, there is an answer to that question. I, I take notes. <laughs> when I realize I'm in that person, I realize, okay, I'm going to have to make sure I bring back, uh, you know, I keep everything in my pocket ready to throw back at them if they come at me with that kind of thing. And once you realize you're in the presence of that person, they're often your boss, you better be ready to fight back because th this person will be, um, will have no mercy. <laughs> Um, but it also could be your own body or your own psychology when an illness or circumstances cause you to think your own uh, mental state or your, the way you're thinking is just untrustworthy. And I have a thought, and that is whenever I start to feel a genuine illness, I say to myself, this is not a time for serious questions. Like if I'm feeling badly physically, this is not the time when I should be asking serious questions about how come no one loves me? How come I'm alone? This is not the time for those questions. Uh, it's not the time when, you know, uh, you're, you, something radically bad has happened in a relationship and you're feeling really down and depressed. This is not the time to ask those questions. Uh, you know, if someone you loved has just died, this is not the time to ask those questions. This is the time to go through it to figure out the answer to the immediate problems, but it's not the time to suddenly say, you know, what is the meaning of life? If you don't know by this moment, you're not going to find out during this moment. So, uh, but those, so, but each of those situations already assumes something is radically wrong. And, and that's why you have to use some of these more doubtful techniques of question answering. But basically, starting with radical doubt gets you nowhere. Because what you're doing is you're underlying... This is why the shift in philosophy from um, ontology to epistemology, which basically means from what the thing is to how we can know the thing is there, is a, is a very dangerous shift philosophically. philosophically. Because it's essentially saying, uh, how can we know anything? How can I trust what I'm looking through with my eyes? Now, like I said, there are situations where the doubt is warranted. But it can't be every day. It can't be everyone. It can't be all the time. Uh, you, you have to be able to uh, say some things are actually there. You know, if I point and say, where does this water go? I have to say, well, you know, it's because it's water. Uh, where, is it, where is it going? You know, I can't say, how do I know there's even water there? When you enter on that line of questioning, how do I know it's even there? You are essentially undercutting the possibility of an answer. What's happened is inside your head, you have shifted from being in a world that makes the kind of sense that scientists find answers to, that artists are looking for answers for, that uh, theologians 
are seeking to understand. And you've moved into the realm where, you know, it there is no answer. Only nihilists enjoy this zone a lot. And yet, at the same time, I would say this, this sense of questioning everything uh, in, in the kind of way that, how can I know what I know? How do I know whose story is true? How do I know that any story is true? This is also the postmodern, like, bread and butter. You start there, and then you reconstruct in your own, after your own image. A uh, constant questioning of every aspect of everything ends up being a psychological disease. It ends up being paranoia and neurosis. That's one reason why you can know it's not real, or it's not good for you. It's real. The questions are there. I mean, anyone, I can go out and start, I mean, I can pick apart everything in my life right now and get myself so depressed. And yet, that's not, that's not the reality of the situation. You know, the fact that I can do it doesn't mean that that's the reality of it. You know, uh... It, it's a bit like a child asking questions, asking the word why to the point of absurdity, you know. So, we're not going to the zoo today. Why? Because the car isn't working. Why? Because I didn't have enough money for a good car, and so we're driving a bad car. Why? And, you know, you just keep following these questions that lead to infinity. Well, that kind of questioning... You know, I can understand why a child, child does it, but at a certain point, the child ought to have enough uh, uh, structure and solidity in their life to understand what a broken car is and stop the question there. <laughs> you know, they ought to have enough compassion and empathy, which has been trained into them by their parents, to be able to look and say, ah, oh, yeah, we just don't have enough money to afford a good car, without going on and on and on, you see. Because a, a child who does that and brings that kind of habit into adulthood is not going to get very far. No one's going to tolerate that sort of thing when you're an adult at a job and you're working and someone says, you know, well, why do I have to type on the computer? You know, or, or as uh, the famous uh, line of Alfred Hitchcock, what was it? Montgomery Clift said, I don't understand my motivation in this scene. And Alfred Hitchcock said, your motivation is that you are an actor being paid to produce a certain effect. Something like that. It was just like, yeah, you're an actor getting paid. Just forget about your motivation and do the job. You know, that was Alfred Hitchcock's old school advice, which I think we could uh, take uh, a bit of a hint from sometimes. Uh, so, what I've seen is that we need to learn how to ask simple questions first. Ontological questions. What is it questions? And I find that because people don't do this, especially, I would say most people, whether they know it or not, just through the, the movies and the music and all the stuff, the books that we've been reading for the last, you know, like uh, 75 years or so, these books cause you to question what you're looking at. as And not question in the good way, but question as if there is no possible answer. Um, and yet, by doing that, one prevents the possibility of an answer. So, uh, a good ontological question. A child is walking along with, uh, we'll say, with a boy with his father, and they find a strange thing on the ground. And he says, what is this? And the, and the father says, why, this is a snail. And you go, and the boy goes, oh, interestingly enough, just by giving it a name, it gives it more meaning. Uh, without giving it a name, what would it be? A weird thing on ground next to weird ground, because that doesn't have a name either. Weird thing on weird thing. You need to give it a name in order to help it find its place within your mind and so that you can understand it. Uh, now, the answer will work for a while. You know, it doesn't tell you that much what's a snail, <laughs> you know, which is the next logical question. And um, to say it's a little animal that creeps along the ground, it's got a, it's kind of like a worm, but it's got a, uh, a shell on its back, and, it, and it'll zip itself into the snail. It can ca crawl straight up a wall, and that's how you would explain to a child what a snail is, you can explain all the things it does, because that helps you to understand what a snail is. 
What's it do? Um, now, later, there might be other questions that are more complicated, like, why does it have a, sh a, a, a shell? And why is it sticky? Well, maybe you know the answer and can give that answer to your child quickly. I think most people would probably go, uh, and kind of hesitate a minute. And But this is a good opportunity for the parent raising a child to say, um, let's go home and check this up in a book and find out together. And I purposely say in a book and not online for a very, very good reason. First of all, you should have some books, if you're raising children, you should have some books about animals and all of this stuff. You shouldn't depend on the internet, upon Wikipedia, upon that sort of thing as your first uh, source. Why? Because then your children will do the same thing. If you want them to appreciate knowledge and reading, you have to do it yourself. Because they will immediately see, if you're if you say... Yes, you should be reading books. Oh, here's the answer on Wikipedia. Well, that's like the parent who says to their child, you, should be, uh, you shouldn't smoke while they're smoking. You see, if you want your child to grow up and to question things, then you have to prove that you too can question things. And one of the things they really are going to need questioning about is what is the nature of this beast with a screen that everybody's got. Because if you just assume it's there and we all know what it is, you're setting your, your child up to essentially just be indoctrinated by whatever it does to them. So, uh, okay, enough of that. What's interesting is often extremely challenging, hot arguments are wrapped in unasked simpler questions. That is to say that, uh, you know, I've been in pre the presence of people who have argued about homosexuality. Is it a sin? Where does it come from? Why is, you know, all of, you know, it's just like, were we born that way and all this? And to me, what's not being asked, because everyone thinks they know, but if you, no one's talking about it, they don't know. And the question is, what is it? And that sounds like, a, well, it's just, it's just what? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's a lot harder to define than you, you understand. For instance, if you go back 150 years, no one used the word. So what did they do, you discuss then? You know, did the Romans or the Greek, ancient Greeks use the word? No, they didn't have the concept. So what is it? What is it? If you don't answer that question, all of your argumentation, all of your discussion is going to be just absolutely pointless. Because you don't even know what you're talking about, whether you're even meant talking about the same thing. People, te uh, people seem to think that just simply having an opinion means you know something. And it's not true. Uh, see Propaganda 101. The truth is, is that the simplest questions are often the hardest to answer. Now, like I said before, I've been making a documentary about puppetry. And one of the two main questions that always get asked in my questioning is, what is a puppet? And I also always preface it with usually something like, when, okay, now I want to ask you, probably the hardest question you'll have today. And they're always like, yes. And then I'll say, what is a puppet? And then they'll be like, like they know and how hard it is to explain. And I'm not going to explain it for you. You can go look at my puppetry videos. But the point is this. It's not as simple as it looks. It's just not as simple as it looks. The, these very basic things are often the hardest. What is love? Well, here's a question we really need some answers for. And this is one that gets us in absolute trouble. And everyone thinks they know the answer. And in a way they do. Everyone knows you're supposed to love people. But what does that mean? What does love mean? Um, people generate all sorts of unhelpful slogans like, um, I don't know. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, 
The Beatles sang All You Need Is Love, and Larry Norman later added, and then they broke up. <laughs> you know, uh, Stephen still sang If You Can't Be With The One You Love, Love The One You're With. What does that mean? <laughs> um, love means never having to say you're sorry. So far, I'm just kind of starting in the middle of the 60s and just going into the 70s. And I could skip to the present, and, and now the big quote about love is, love is love. Which to me is like saying, I don't know, a dog is a dog. What does it mean? It hasn't told you anything. And, you know, for instance, if Stephen Stills is right, love the one you're with, he means have sex with. He doesn't even mean have romantic feelings about. It. What's the difference between love and romance and sex? And if what are the Beatles singing when they sing, all you need is love? Do they mean to love other people, uh, you know, as, as yourself? Or do they mean sex? What do they mean? You see? So to say love is love is, is almost a meaningless phrase. Like everyone thinks they know. You have to ask those questions, which is why C.S. Lewis wrote that book called The Four Loves. And he talks about four different Greek words for love that mean radically different things. So there's the love of a mother for the child, storge. There's the uh, uh, phil uh, philea, which is uh, brotherly love or friendship kind of love. There's eros, the erotic love, the, the love between a man and a woman. There is agape, which is the, the, the love that is what I think the Beatles were trying to say with All You Need Is Love, uh, which is that love... To love everyone, to do no harm, to, to do good things for people. But, hey, love is one of the most complicated things in the world. Endless poems and songs and stories and essays and books and films. And uh, you just go on and on. Have been made on the subject of love. And why do they do that? Because it's something we need to know, but it's also something we're always on the verge of misunderstanding. And one of the strangest things about love is that if I say to someone, I need you to love me, I am no longer showing that person love. What does this mean? Uh, the person who says, you know, uh, it just goes on and on. It's love. But you need to ask the questions. You need to look around. Observation is a key here. I think the best questions... Are these questions that are basic things? Uh, like I just put out a video on shadows. Before you can do the whole Jungian shadow trip, you better understand what a shadow is. And this is what I'm talking about, about people getting everything back to front. They're talking about all these metaphors and stuff, and they don't know what the thing is. Before you attach a symbol to it, you should understand what a thing the thing is. Before you see it symbolically, you should just see it in its context, which is, uh, everything is in many, many contexts. But to ask questions, you know, I have cats from the neighborhood come up to me, and I look at them, and I just say, like, what strange creatures these are. You know, I don't look at them as cute animals. I look at them as they live in, a, to me, a very d disturbing world. When I hear them fighting with each other, when I hear them, I mean, yeah, you know, sex sounds completely like rape to a cat. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow! You know, uh, I mean, and, and the males would come along and eat the kittens. This is not a lovely world. Yeah, they do give you those saucer eyes because they've learned how to manipulate you with them. Long time ago, cats realized if they just opened their eyes up and kind of gave you that look, which is a really good illustration of that is the, uh, the Puss in Boots in Shrek. You know, it just stops. He's like, ah, I'm a cat. Ah, and then all of a sudden, you know, they learned how to do that to manipulate you into giving them food and warmth and things you need, they need or would like, like laying on, on top of a nice warm spot in the sun. Uh, but observation, learn how to see. And learn how to see the way Rookmacher talks about it in What is Reality. Learn how to see fully. Not just, you know, it's just like this isn't just a computer. It is connected to all this other stuff. This is not a small thing in my room that I control. It is a big thing that is always on the verge of controlling me. 
That's what observation will do. Is it t tells you. I mean, someone has said, when when should our children be uh, get a, a, cell, a smartphone? My my basic thought about it is, I don't know if kids should be allowed anywhere near a screen until they can articulate it. You know, which may be tough on parents who like to spend a lot of time watching Netflix. But, you know, I mean, I've seen so many parents these days who put their child in front of, like, I don't know, Baby Shark video. That's why it has more watches than any, uh, more views than any other video on YouTube. Baby Shark, look it up. It's got billions of views. Why? Because parents will sit their little toddler down in front of it and walk away and let the thing go on and on and on. And the kids, of course, being kids, are kind of like mesmerized by the lights. And my feeling is you shouldn't be doing that to your children. You should let them know that this is a re really a privilege that they will get to do someday. This isn't just something you let kids do. Having a smartphone isn't just something we do because everyone else does it. You know, observation. What is the thing? To ask questions of it. So let me conclude with a demonstration of how I ask questions and where they lead to. That, and this is... Uh, just a question about the world around me and how it basically informs everything about me today. So when I was about 13 years old, in the year 1967, was I 12, 13, anyway, uh, 1967, I was around 13 years old, and I was walking on a dirt road that ran behind the apartment I lived in with my mother. And I was with uh, one of my childhood uh, friends, and we were walking along listening to the KFRC top 30, Big 30 for the week. And um, and they played the song that was coming up that was like, oh, this is a new song. And it, was, uh, it was near the end of the summer. And it was uh, Jimi Hendrix, Purple Haze. First time I'd ever heard Jimi Hendrix in my life. However, at my local record store, when I go buy my little 45s and stuff, they were already talking about Jimi Hendrix. They were saying, wow, you won't believe this guy. And I was like, huh, okay. And I'd, I'd heard the name already, but I didn't know anything about him. Suddenly I heard the song Purple Haze, which starts off with these tremendously discordant sounds. I mean, really tritony stuff. And then all of a sudden the bass and the drum kick in and, and Jimi Hendrix moves into these really heavy power chords. And it's like, it's like someone just rolled a tank through the room in my head. You know, it's just like, what is this? I never heard anything like this. And of course, being a kid who likes crazy stuff, I was just like, wow, this is great. And so did my friend. And so did, I'm sure did millions upon millions of other kids listening to music and teenagers and adults who were at all vaguely aware of what was going on. They heard Jimi Hendrix and said, whoa, we've never heard anything like this before. And it was during a time when music was really changing. And, and actually, the, for me, the pivotal moment in uh, 20th century music history where everything just, just moves and changes completely is during 1967. Late 66, early 67. Everything from Sgt. Peppers and The Doors and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and, and uh, the Rolling Stones, although they were kind of out of the, out of it a little bit at that time. But still, this big thing is changing radically. And it put a couple of thoughts in my head that I later pursued. One was, why is the music changing so much? And this went with me because I was a kid growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area was why was I seeing these people, with, these guys with long hair and these girls wearing these weird kind of paisley granny dresses or whatever? Why was I seeing things changing? What was this whole thing about drugs going around that I would he hear about? Um, and, and along with where, why was the music changing and hence the whole society was this one question. Where did Jimi Hendrix get his sound from? Now, if you know anything about uh, the history of rock and roll music, you, you'll start sit, saying there are things like, well, there was gospel music and country music and blues and jazz, and all these things kind of came together, and none of those explained Jimi Hendrix. And I remember years later, this question still bothered me, because I knew enough um, by the time I was, say, 23 or so, when I got to Switzerland, 
to realize it was sometime right bef before I went there that I figured out, well, you know what it was, it was when I was um, probably around 20 years old. And for some reason or another, I found myself in the Sonoma State University Library listening to music because I had started being interested in music again, but listening to music on uh, headphones, uh, an album by Ralph Vaughan Williams, and it was his Symphonia Antarctica. And as there's a part in it where the orchestra swells, it's it's basically was originally a soundtrack for a movie, Scott of the Antarctic, and there's a section where the music starts to slowly build with the, again these discordant sort of sounds, and then all of a sudden this this heaviness comes in, and then an organ comes in. It's like, <clears throat> and I think that prodded me. I'd already heard Bach Staccata and Fugue in D minor, which had this heavy sound, and I suddenly said, ah. And then I eventually spent time looking for how Jimi Hendrix might have heard that sound. And I'm not going to go spoil the answer because I plan on doing something about it someday. But the point was that it was clear to me that Jimi Hendrix was his sound for one thing. By this point, I was I had become a Christian by this point, obviously, and and. But one of the things that occurred to me was that Jimi Hendrix music represented some kind of modernist kind of rage, uh, you know, the, as the name of the group goes, uh, Rage Against the Machine, although these days they sound more like Rage with the Machine. But there was this thing, and I think what so many kids connected with was this intensity that they kind of felt. This, this existential dread and anxiety. So in order to track down the answer to this question, how, how could Jimi Hendrix have heard this music? Because he had to have connected, I, I found it in the early 20th century, he had to have somehow connected this. And this was during a time when these modernist trends were coming in. And I knew enough about different kinds of art and stuff. And I said, I had to look down. By hunting down the answer to that question, I eventually found myself back at Beethoven. I found myself learning about modern art. I found myself um, just becoming more historically educated. I found myself, well, of course, knowing the history of rock and roll backwards and forwards, the history of jazz, which certain other developments there seem to mirror uh, Jimi Hendrix. I saw, uh, you know, you know, what's going on with John Cage? What's going on with Karl Heinz Stockhausen? I started finding all these things. But one thing always led to another. And eventually, by the time I left New York, and one of the reasons I decided to leave New York was because I had figured out the answer to not only the Jimi Hendrix question, but the larger question, why the music had changed and how that affected the people in the 20th century. Which is what, basically, I spend all my time doing now, is trying to answer these kinds of questions and put them in context and to give them in such a way as that other people might be able to understand something from whatever I've come to understand. So, from starting with that question, where did Jimi Hendrix get his sound, I would say I built, not all of my life, but a huge chunk of my life upon that question. And Owen Barfield once said an interesting thing, and in it, it's at the be beginning of his book, uh, Romanticism Comes of Age, which is not one of my favorite books by him, and I wouldn't recommend starting there. But this line uh, definitely stuck with me, and he basically said, if you start with any subject and really try to understand it, in other words, if you start with any question and really try to get to the bottom of it, you will eventually hit the same things that are happening in every other field. Because these tensions are happening in science and in culture and in politics and in art and in, you know, uh, food manufacturing. And, you know, there, there's this whole series of tensions. And that's essentially how uh, I followed the, the, the line of questions to get me to where I am today. And so, you know, you're not going to do the same thing. You're going to do whatever you do, which might be, uh, I don't know, 
turning bowls uh, out of uh, wood on a lathe. It could be, uh, you know, um, I don't know, uh, making journals up of your life. It could be uh, learning how to bake uh, the best zucchini bread. You know, if you follow one of these things and keep asking more questions, you will eventually find that this opens the world up for you. I have never understood anyone who says that the world is boring. And I, all I can say is those people don't know how to ask questions. Because when you ask one question, it opens up another. And it gets fascinating. And it's that fascination that I want to pass on to you and say, go, ask questions. You know, don't be a stick in the mud. Don't just receive all of your entertainment, you know, push back at it. Ask questions about it. For me, there's different points. For instance, I will look for a piece of music. Um, recently, I've been following, uh, uh, spending time with uh, the 1960s musician uh, Leon Russell. And uh, there's some, he has some very interesting things. So I'm f following that. But as I follow that, it opens up other doors. I'm sitting there going like, ah, he sounds a bit like Dr. John. Is there a connection? You know, and looking for these things that uh, connect. And it's just like, oh, Leon Russell. And then it, it's like I'm sitting there, sitting there, sitting there saying to myself, Elton John. This is Elton John before Elton John. And then I realize, I look at it and Elton John later in his life said, Leon Russell was my mentor. And I said, nailed it. That's what good questions can do for you. Because it's not just raising the question. Then you look for the answer. And that's what makes life interesting. And the truth is, you see, to me, you start with knowing that there must be a connection. There are answers. There are answers to the questions. You just have to spend time digging around. And you should do that. And that, my friends, is the anadromous life in a nutshell. Swimming against the stream. Do that, and let's meet again soon. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.